So one of the reasons that you want to calculate a shape's moment of inertia is so that you can see how it's going to respond to an external torque being applied. And so in today's video, we're going to start with the same moment of inertia calculation that we had before. Uh, for simplicity, we'll just worry about a ring for right now. You'll be able to change out that shape later in one of the problems at the end of the video. And then we go through the moment of inertia calculation uh, about the z-axis just like we had before. Um, we're going to add a marker dot to it so that we can see the thing rotate. Uh, so we'll change one of the atoms color to white just so we can you know, put a mark on it. And then uh, down here is where we add our new uh, part to the code. First, we establish a force that we're going to apply to the shape that we're interested in. This shape's going to go uh, just in the Y direction for right now. We'll change that up in a minute. Uh, but then when you want to rotate something, you have to take that force and apply it at a particular location. So here we're going to apply the force at the very edge of the ring along the right hand side. So along the right edge, this force is going to point upward. And so in order to help us visualize that, we're going to create a visual for the force. So we've created an, an arrow uh, up above here called force underscore vector. And so we're going to set its location to be whatever location the force was up above. And we're going to set its axis to scale with the force. Now, uh, this is uh, changing units of force and units of distance, so just to keep it on the screen, uh, we've set up a scale factor um, up here. Uh, you can adjust that number if you can't see the force that you use, but I know that this combination works and makes it visible, so we'll go with that for right now. Uh, it's at that point that we can calculate the torque on the shape. Torque is given as the cross product of the force's location vector with the force vector itself. And rather than work out all of the cross product math, we're using GlowScript's built-in cross function here because GlowScript knows how to do the cross product for us, so we might as well let it. Um, that will calculate a torque vector. It's going to point perpendicular to both the force location vector and the force vector up here. And then we just use uh, our good old Euler-Cromer method. If you need a review of Euler-Cromer, uh, there is a link to a, a video about that in the description below. But hopefully by now, you've learned uh, a little bit about how to set up Euler-Cromer. Basically, we're updating the shape's rotational velocity or angular velocity, omega. Uh, we're adding to that the torque divided by the moment inertia times dt. If this looks familiar, it has the exact same setup as velocity equals old velocity plus force over mass times dt. We're just trading out velocity for angular velocity, we're trading out force for torque, and we're trading out mass for moment of inertia. And then what's really neat about this is that GlowScript has a rotate function built in. Um, again, I'll have a link to a video about that in the description below uh, so that we can actually rotate the entire shape. Remember, we took all these atoms and compounded them together into a single shape. Uh, in order to use the rotate function, you have to give an angle that you're rotating about. So that's going to be the angular velocity times dt and an axis. That's just going to be the, the axis, the direction of the uh, angular velocity omega that we calculated earlier. Um, so let's run this to see what it looks like when we've got this constant force applying. So here we've got our force vector. Uh, again, it's pointing upward, but it's located to the right. And that makes the thing turn counterclockwise. So this is like you're, you're grabbing your steering wheel and you're exerting a force this way. And so you're making the wheel turn, or you're making the car turn left. So the wheel is turning uh, counterclockwise in this case. And you notice that it's getting faster, which is easy to see because of the marker dot that we added here. Uh, that's because a constant force uh, is going to cause the thing to accelerate, uh, to spin faster and faster. It's going to angularly accelerate just the same way a constant force uh, causes a thing to move with increasing velocity, causes it to linearly accelerate. So the same general principles apply. Now, let's see what happens when we increase this force vector. Let's increase this force magnitude by a factor of five. We'll keep it going in the same direction. We're going to increase its magnitude. Uh, if, if my analogy holds, then the thing should increase in acceleration. And of course, I've greatly increased the force there. So the force arrow is increased. If I zoom in, we can get uh, back to our animation here. And you can see that the thing is spinning faster. It's accelerating at a greater rate. Uh, because again, just with an analogy with force, the thing is going to achieve a greater acceleration uh, with a greater force applied. Now let's suppose, let's put this back to 0 0.1, get it back to a little bit more reasonable value. Let's suppose we add on an X component to this thing. So we'll have 0 0.1, 0 0.1, but let's leave the force location the same. 
So when I click run here, my force is pointing at an angle over here because it's pointing uh, uh, to the right now in addition to upward. But if you compare this animation with the last one, you can actually see that it's going to accelerate at the same rate as before. That's because in this cross product, remember a cross product only cares about multiplying perpendicular components. If I add an X component here, but this force location only has an X component, these two things never multiply in the cross product. So this thing is only gonna multiply these two zeros. So I can make this uh, rightward component whatever I want, let's make it 0 0.3, the thing is gonna rotate with the same angular acceleration until I change the force's location. So for example, here I've moved the force to point at about a 45, or to be located at about a 45 degree angle from the center of rotation. It's still not quite pointing tangentially because I don't have these components equal, but you can see that the, the ring is accelerating at a greater rate here because I've got more of the force pointing in the correct direction perpendicular to the force location. Um, here I can actually make them directly uh, perpendicular to each other because um, this will give me a 45 degree angle, this will give me a 45 degree angle. And so you can see the thing accelerate faster than it did before when they weren't pointing in the uh, perpendicular direction to each other. So here I've reset our force and force location to their original values for you to use on the problems that will follow at the end of the video. The first problem is going to ask you to create a graph of the magnitude of omega versus time. And so you'll do that here in line 56 in this blank that I've left for you. You'll need to remember how to set up an, a graph in vPython and how to add data points to it. Um, there will be a link to a video in the description below about how to do that. I've gone ahead and created the graph for you. Um, way up here at the top of the code, this omega underscore graph. So you can use this G curve object uh, to add points to the graph uh, if you just put in that one command here on line 56. But again, you'll need to look up how to do that. And once you have that graph, you'll be able to answer the other problems at the end of the video.